Anson Chan, former Chief Secretary of Hong Kong and former Legislative Councillor. Uh, you've been speaking at um, INSEAD at the Leadership Summit uh, Asia 2008, basically um, talking about your experiences um, in Hong Kong and when you, you ran for um, the legislature. Before that you had been in a very powerful position as Chief Secretary, but unappointed. Why did you decide to uh, risk your reputation in an election? You're right uh, in that there is a risk to my reputation. But I just felt uh, that uh, last December, when this opportunity to um, stand uh, for elected office came up, that for me personally, it was a defining moment in my life. Um, I thought that um, I should put my money where my mouth is. I've been advocating a quicker pace of democracy. Uh, and I felt it important uh, in terms of the message that I sent to the SAR government and the central government, but also in terms of the message that I sent to the community as a whole, that I should stand up and be counted. So I decided to enter the fray. I ran on a very clear platform of uh, full democracy in 2012. In the event, we didn't manage to achieve that, but we at least now have two firm dates from central government, which is 2017 for the election of the chief executive and 2020 for the election of all members of the legislature. So you're confident that uh, Hong Kong will see full democracy within, say, 10, 15 years? Well, let me so put it this out. way. I believe that central government is sincere in these two dates that they mean what they say. The challenge and the difficulty is going to be uh, how we define what is meant by universal suffrage. And so from that point of view, in the next few years, I'm going to continue to uh, speak out on how I think we should move from where we are to achieving genuine universal suffrage in 2017 and 2020. And it will take some doing because I fear that the government mm, will not be doing uh, a genuine public consultation. So um, I, together with a group of like-minded people, we've set up what we call a Citizens Commission on Constitutional Development to provide a platform for public debate on this very important issue. Do you think you left it a bit too late to go to the polls, to to canvass for votes, to no, campaign? No, I think, I, think, uh, I think, although when I was in government, you are not always free to come out mm, and speak your mind. Mm. Nevertheless, within government, I've always supported democracy. Mm. I've always, you know, um, uh, tried to spread the message of what democracy actually means. Mm. Responsible, accountable government, and being open and transparent, allowing maximum participation by the public. And so um, having, you know, retired, chose to retire mm, 18 months earlier, than would otherwise be the case. And with this opportunity, I just thought it was time. Um, I took this opportunity and made it abundantly clear uh, to the community that I'm fully behind uh, universal suffrage. So you have no political ambitions now? No, I don't. Uh, I believe I still have a useful role to play in terms of uh, speaking out, not only on constitutional development, but on generally on good governance. It's something that I care passionately about. Many people would have uh, voted for you if, it, if they'd had the chance to become uh, chief executive. Would you, would you have liked to have had, had the chance to run for that position? Well, uh, we're not going to have popular election of the chief executive until 2017. And I just feel by that time, I will be in my early 70s. And it's a little, you know, it, it's a little old to, to be assuming what, you know, would be a very, very demanding and challenging job. So I will leave that to somebody younger. Is there a new generation coming through? Uh, I'm hoping to encourage the younger generation to understand what is behind One Man, One Vote, uh, to um, appreciate the need for them personally, whether you are a student, you are a businessman, you're a professional and a, or an academic, the need for you to participate in the political process. And there are many ways in which you can participate. You can either stand for election, you can make it your business to be concerned about governance and how the government behaves, you can speak out or when it is necessary to speak out, or you can mentor and encourage other people to stand for election by supporting them financially. 
The argument about allowing de full democracy in Hong Kong, um, that uh, the argument has always been that it's going to be difficult for China to hand over that um, right, if it were, um, as uh, there's going to be a clamor for democracy across China. Do, well, I, do you I don't think that's an argument? Uh, no, I don't think that that is an argument. I think actually central government has nothing to fear uh, by giving Hong Kong people uh, the right to vote for our own chief executive and members of our legislature. If you look at the quality, the behavior of the Hong Kong people, uh, you look at uh, you know, the whole history of how Hong Kong people conduct affairs, the fact that they don't rely on the government, that there is increasing trust um, of a central government. Um, I think, in fact, central government should be pretty relaxed and should regard the implementation the development of representative government in Hong Kong uh, as a showcase, a testing ground for how democracy might be introduced in stages within mainland China as a whole. It may be that um, growth in China uh, will hit a wall um, in terms of per capita income if it doesn't um, develop its own institutions, and not necessarily democracy, but accountability, yes. rule of law, and so on. Do you see that as being a major issue? Well, no economy can continue, I think, uh, to grow at the pace that the Chinese economy has grown in the uh, several decades since open door policy. Mm. Uh, and um, there is a real prospect that growth might slow down, uh, and I think uh, in the light of that, there is perhaps uh, an added uh, urgency to um, putting in place uh, some of the institutions of civil society. Which ones would you say are the most important at this stage? I think the rule of law and not the rule of man. I think an independent judiciary. But I also think it's very important to encourage a much more vigorous and freer press. And that was shown uh, the yes in the, the wake of the Sichuan yes in the, the wake of the Sichuan uh, earthquake, and whereby we we're seeing um, Chinese leadership almost acting as politicians. Yes, in terms of absolutely. But uh, the, the the question really is whether that in the wake of that experience that this more relaxed attitude towards the press will prevail or whether there will be you know, the tendency to rein in again. Do you see China still growing, being able to grow economically and yet not change politically? No, um, I think it is almost an inevitable uh, process of economic liberalization, that there will be a degree of political liberalization. Not at the pace that you and I might wish to see, but nevertheless, I think the central government will continue to take small steps forward on the political side. Is that because there's going to be an, an undercurrent of demand? Yes, there will be an undercurrent of demand because um, as people get the basic necessities of life satisfied, they're going to look at the way government formulates policy. They're going to ask themselves, why is it I don't have more of a say in decisions that affect my everyday life? And corruption is another issue that yes. affects many I think corruption, every day, endemic so. corruption, is something that the leadership is very alert to. The question really is whether there is, you know, the concomitant appreciation that you need the institutional underpinnings to really deal effectively with endemic corruption. Could China learn from Hong Kong's example? It is, in, in fact, learning. You know, there is a great deal. There is increasing collaboration and cooperation on dealing with corruption. They're very interested in, and they know how ICAC was established in Hong Kong. Why was it necessary? Uh, what um, are the um, powers that an effective ICAC uh, needs to have? But there needs to be a very strong political will because there will be a great deal of vested interest involved. But also you've got a huge difference of scale. That Absolutely. For example, with Hong Kong, True. Singapore, very small yeah. territory. Yes. Yes. Um, keeping tight rein on corruption within China must be almost impossible. Yeah, because it is so much a part of the uh, mindset. Mm -hmm. And one can appreciate that in the days when everything was in scarce supply, to even get a light bulb, you have to pay somebody under the table to get a light bulb. So when demand far outstrips supply. You can understand how in that sort of environment, mm, uh, corruption uh, takes root. 
But I think the country as a whole is now at a stage of development where there has to be some serious attempt made to deal with corruption. And I th believe the leadership is alert to this. Are you generally optimistic about yes, China's I am, future? Yes, I am optimistic. If you look at the current generation, the next generation of leaders, the technocrats, the people you know, who are party secretaries and you know, uh, leaders in the provinces, uh, a lot of people comment on you know, uh, how impressive they are. I think also it's an inevitable process of the country opening up, the fact that more Chinese are being educated overseas, they can see for themselves um, the advantages of a democracy, as there are you know, some dis disadvantages. Nobody pretends that democracy is a panacea for all ills. Arlington Chan, thank you for joining us on INSEAD Knowledge. Thank you.